what happens to jobs when everything is automated. Bob Resselman is a speaker at scale, the Linux conference this year, and he's a contributor to opensource.com. He has been studying the impact of automation on jobs. And his upcoming talk is called, What Happens to Jobs When Everything is Automated? Bob, welcome to ZDNet Government, and welcome to our Politics and Policy Coffee House. How are you today? Oh, good. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I've got my coffee. I hope you have yours. I have my coffee in my exactly. blue cup. There we go. That way this will be a nice caffeinated discussion. Yeah. So you've been looking at this question of what happens when everything is automated. And, and so that's a presupposition. What makes you think that everything is going to be automated? Well, everything's going to be automated because everything has been automated. Um, if we go back through history, we can see that um, mechanization and machines have been a constant part of the commercial endeavor, uh, particularly around the invention of the steam engine. Before the steam engine came along, everything, all power was either water, wind, or humid, uh, or animal. And then the steam engine comes along and magnifies the ability to um, just make immense amounts of power. And many people are calling that the first machine age, and then the second machine age comes along when we start creating computation, uh, automatic computation. So if we go through history, uh, we can see that not only have things become automated, but the rate of automation has accelerated in dramatic effect. Well, the, I mean, going all the way back to the Romans, I mean, they, they used wooden clockwork machinery for a lot of, of their work. And, and, you know, they've augmented human power with machines forever. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that nobody has jobs. So the question I'm going to ask is, in 2017, how, since we've been automating forever, since we've been using machine augmentation forever, what makes 2017 the beginning of the point where no one has jobs because the robots are taking over? Right. Well, no, people do have jobs, and people do have a lot of jobs, but the nature of the work is changing, and it's going to change dramatically. Um, there's a study that came out of Oxford that's saying that most work for people that make under $20 an hour, and by $20 an hour work, we're looking at people that have some college, maybe no college, and they're doing what we can call trainable work. I, I get a job, somebody brings me onto the factory floor or into the office, and they teach me how to do the job, and then I do it for a year, two years, maybe forever, and I get compensated for that. That is pretty much what we now call automated uh, artificial intelligence. We take some robotic, um, mechanism or we take some computational mechanism and we teach you how to do something we do it over and over again so that sort of work is going to be automated dramatically and for example um, i've been working for a long time i've been working since i was 15 years old and one of the jobs i had at the beginning of my work life which is what i did let me share it with you i worked in the garment district and i was an inventory controller and what i did is i sat in front of this big machine full of index cards and i pulled an invoice off a stack and i deducted the what well, the machine part that was on the invoice from the inventory i was okay. really a human computer that job's gone that job is now done automatically, and that's over a period of maybe 40 years. So what we're seeing now is those sort of, again, trainable jobs are being eliminated. Uh, one, go to a factory floor, and if you go to automotive, an, auto, an automotive floor where they make cars, good half to three quarters of that work is now automated. Um, there is still some stuff that can't be done by machines, but it's only a matter of time. And I can go into what that matter of time looks like. So. It's happening. The Ball State study says that um, of human displacement, uh, only 12% is due to offshoring. 88% is due from increased uh, productivity, automation. There's a study coming out of Oxford that's saying, again, most of those people making under $20 an hour, they're not going to be employed. So the interesting question here is, now, when, when I wrote How to Save Jobs, which was roughly seven years ago or so, I looked at mm -hmm. the 1990s, the transition in the 1990s, when uh, both China and India started to become part of the world economy. And so mm -hmm. what happened is all of a sudden you have just about half of humanity suddenly deciding to be part of the world economy and all of those folks wanting to move into the middle class and have good lives. And so mm -hmm. 
what we saw happen was, you know, in China for a while, people were working on, on roughly two bucks a day. Mm -hmm. And so we offshored a lot of our work, but they built up automation as well. And so they're working in, you know, roboticized factories and, and they have a mix of, of labor and not labor. But, you know, when we look at, at changing technologies back in the day, for example, when I first got started, we had key punch operators and we wrote on coding forms and we wrote our, our code on coding forms that went down to this, this entire industry of key punch operators who took the coding forms and typed them in and created punch cards, which we then ran in the computer. And, you know, as interactive computing came into play, as, as coders started coding in editors, uh, what happened was those key punch operators essentially lost their gig, but the technology industry has grown so much that, that kind of work has been augmented by web designers and SEO experts and all of the other things in tech. So even if we put robotics in, what makes it, what makes the situation where, where what happens when everything is automated? How do we get to the everything point? Right. That, that's, a, well, that, that's an interesting question. And when do we get to the everything point? Um, Kurtz, Kurtzweil, Ray Kurzweil saying tw uh, 2045, the singularity when machines can start doing uh, what we can do better, and now we're going to have to start augmenting ourselves, human beings, into being machines. So that's um, that's coming. Uh, let, let's postpone what we do um, when everything is automated for a minute, because we bring up an interesting point, and that's about um, moving on in jobs. And one of the things I've noticed is that um, the jobs that are out there in the future, the jobs you're doing now, are what we're calling the good jobs, those are those are complex jobs, okay? You have to know a lot to play. And if we look at the statistics, I'm looking at the statistics here at the U.S. Census Bureau that's saying people with a bachelor's degree, that's only 32% of people that, are, that have attended school. So there's still a lot of people that aren't even at the bachelor's level. And I, I don't know about you, but for me, I've been coding for 30 years, and I can say that programming has gotten a lot more difficult. Oh yeah, it's it's just gotten a lot more difficult. So the amount of knowledge you're going to need to play is really at the uh, graduate level. You can't really get. There's some people you get. Oh yeah, teach somebody how to code in 13 weeks and all that stuff. I, I'm not buying that. I don't know what the quality. And of the yet there are is. so many talented programmers out there who have no college. Right, and I know many of them, but that's a minority. I think intuitively, I can say that's a minority. Um, you know, there's a I, when I was in college, I had a, an excellent professor who didn't have a college uh, degree, but he was a very happened to be a very good composer, and he was recognized as such. He just studied music forever. So yes, there's always going to be exceptions to the rule, but we're talking lots and lots and lots of people. All right. So if we look at we have 100 million people in the workforce, and we're saying, gee, of those, you know, 30, let's say 30 percent of those are college educated. That's still 70 million people. Lot, you know, left left over that historically have gone into factories or some sort of service work or they got on the job training. Well, what happens when on the job training is now, if you're good, you know, I just read a book uh, again, I think the second, it's called the second machine age where they start doing an analysis of the benefit of paying labor. And if you can buy a machine and amortize it into, and have it produce at $2 an hour, and now you can't get human beings that you can get human beings down to $2 an hour as your example in China and India. Mm -hmm. But what happens when now the machines start going down to a dollar an hour or 50 cents an hour to work? What happens to those people that hitherto have been on really task oriented work? So, let, so we can answer the question now, if everything is automated and the scary part for me is I, there was an article that came out this week about Microsoft is now using artificial intelligence to teach programs how to write programs and self-replicating self intelligence. I, I, I need more details about that to see if it's viable, but I'm working with a company now that my human interaction is just to, um, I point out data fields on a web page, and the intelligence will just figure out the data structures around that. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. So my job is over in a whole seven minutes. <laughs> so is this sort of a mechanical Turk kind of idea? Uh, it's, it's mechanical. Yes, it is mechanical Turk. And what they're doing is that this company right now, yes, they can't get human intelligence is pattern recognition. That's what human beings are very, very right. good at pattern recognition. It's hard to get a machine to do pattern recognitions. One of the problems the robotic industry has, and I think they might've solved it is being able to identify objects in 3d space, a, uh, 
a vacuum cleaner, one of those floor vacuum cleaners, they're operating 2D space. They're going along a plane and if they hit something, they can figure it out. But being able to have a robot navigate through a room, uh, if you're a chambermaid and say, oh, that's a pillow and that's garbage and do that distinction and throw the, and throw the garbage out and put the pillow on the bed, that's hard. But it's getting there because if we look at the rate, the accelerated, the rate of acceleration of innovation on robotics and artificial intelligence, it's up there. Fast example, it took mankind, it took mankind from recorded history 10,000 years to get an airplane up in the air. 10,000 years, give me that number, okay? It only took 63 years later to get that mankind on the moon, okay? That's just an incredible. Well, that's because of the aliens at Roswell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the aliens at Roswell. But that's an incredible acceleration <laughs> right, when you right. think about it. Yeah. And JPL, I was talking to guys, I, JPL is near me. I was talking to some guys at JPL. There's a lot of unmanned, unhuman space activity going on out there. And that's, that's difficult. So the rate of acceleration is just tremendous. So whether or not this, this, this conversation cannot be about whether or not we think there's aliens out there because, you know, we've, we've all been to Linux trade shows, so we know there yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, and they all use the command line too, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question, and, and I don't want this to get political, but I do want to get this right. Right. Um, so America's new Treasury Secretary, Steve Munchen, mm -hmm. says that increased automation is not even on our radar screen and says that the problem that you're discussing is 50 to 100 more years away. In an interview, he said he he's not worried at all. In fact, he's optimistic about jobs. Now, what's he missing? Well, I think what let's pretend that he is doing 50 years away. Let's pretend that's a real number. Okay, what he's missing, I'm happy you asked me that question too, because something I think a lot about, is that delta in the middle between now and 50 years. Okay. okay. So what happens, let's say between now and 50 years, and let's say 50 years, we're, we're at near robotic um, perpetration, that robots are doing a whole lot of stuff. Okay. Okay. And then we wake up one day, and is it, do we wake up one day? I mean, the, the fantastic extreme is, who ever thought the housing market could collapse until the housing market collapsed? Mm-hmm. And we wake up one day and then, you know, the stock market goes to half its value. People are out of work. Everything's, everybody's throwing their hands up in the air. Okay. Is that what we wait for? Do we say, okay, there has to be some sort of catastrophic, catastrophic event to happen to get to pay attention? Or are we smart enough to say, look, it's coming. It's coming at an accelerated rate. It's something we need to be prepared for. What do we do starting next week toward that 50-year goal? So do you... Yeah. Do you see this as a, a zero sum game where, you know, it's either all automation or all human? I mean, we've been living for, you know, for my entire adult life with, you know, as we mentioned before, augmented machines and, and automated robots and parts building cars. And, and yes, there's no doubt that, that America's automotive factories have, have left the country and those those workers are out of work and there's no doubt that the coal industry is hurting and, and many of the other industries are hurting, but can we completely say, well, that's because robots are coming in or is it because we're changing as a society? Well, we have changed as a society. Actually we've changed as a culture and as a society, the notion of paid work is fairly recent in human um, history. So for example, um, Let's say that you're, you know, you're somebody in 1840 and you've heard about this great land of opportunity called Iowa <laughs> and you leave uh, Massachusetts in um, the summer and you hope to get to Iowa by early spring so you can do a planting so that you don't starve uh, in the coming fall. Money really didn't have any place in that equation other than maybe getting you some fundamental tools if indeed you could purchase them or make them yourselves. So this notion of having to earn money to, have, to sustain your life, it's recent. Is it necessary? Of course it is. Do we all work in a wage economy now? Yes, we do. But that's still fairly recent in the scheme of things. So this notion of having to work for money is, we'll say, new. And so what we're doing with automation, now this notion of having to work for money is still in play, but the money has gone away. Okay, so now what do we do with people when they can't earn money? Okay, and we can say, okay, well, there'll always be jobs. Okay, there will always be jobs, maybe. And of those jobs that are coming, you're going to have to be very, very, very smart to play. 
to have those jobs and you will be compensated for those jobs. But there's still going to be a whole lot of people around that don't have jobs and can't earn money the traditional way. Yeah, but on the other hand, there, you know, and, and, and you know, as, as a guy who wrote a book about saving jobs, you know, I, I definitely can identify and, exp- and look at the problems that a lot of people in this country are hurting. Mm-hmm. But um, when, uh, when, when my toilet wouldn't flush and I ran out of the, the ability to fix it, um, given that I'm a computer scientist and an educator and not a plumber, we called an actual plumber because mm-hmm. my wife is smarter than I am and mm-hmm. made sure we called a plumber. Mm-hmm. That's not something we could, we, 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 we can't really use a plumbing robot. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't call on Alexa and say, you know, Alexa fixed the toilet. We needed, we needed a dude and the dude came and the dude, you know, abided and fixed the toilet. Yeah, he did. And if we go back and again, I'm, I'm getting a little out of the server here, but that's okay. But, you know, going back, you know, 50 years, our car would work. We take it to the mechanic and he'd say, you need a new carburetor and uh, he'd figure it all out. And then he'd put in the carburetor. And now what happens, you take your car to a certified uh, automobile company mechanic. They put in the computer, the computer says, change this part and you change that part. I don't have a problem imagining 20 years from now, the, the car breaking down and when it's in self, because they'll all will be connected. This diagnostics run, the hood opens up a little Amazon drone comes by, forks <laughs> over the part and just drops it in. I don't have a problem imagining that level of self repair. Right. Right. Now, doesn't somebody have to maintain the drone? Right. And that's well. Now we go back. The, well, right now somebody has, well, let's go, let's do automation at one time. Um, if you were if you were a computer programmer and you worked in a distributed environment, you had a guy named Nick, and Nick's job was to move your code onto servers. Yep. Right. Yep. Now Nick's job is to write the automation script that moves your code right, onto servers. Right, 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 right. right. Pretty soon, yeah. So, and then in the future, what's going to happen is you're going to have an inspector that's going. You're going to say, "Here are my three environments. Here's my code. You write the script to get it onto those environments." Mm-hmm. And that's happening. That's yep, happening yep. as we speak. So there's no the notion. Yes, there will there always be to be a need for repair. Oh, of course. Will certain technologies be able to repair themselves while well, some do already. Okay. So let me, end, let, let, let's, mm-hmm. let's sort of begin wrapping this up with, with the sort of elephant in the room, mm-hmm. which is not just automation. It's AI, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's, it's the, the cognitive part of this puzzle mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's changing a lot because we're getting better at doing it. And we have, these vast server resources. It's not just building a, a cognitive device that sits in the most powerful computer you can get in a building. It's, you know, you've got, you know, worldwide server farms that are beginning to become, you know, P1 and, and mm-hmm. you know, that's a reference to the adolescence of P1 folks. Yeah. Um, you know, they're be- beginning to become these, these global uh, databases of big data that they can tap into and then, you know, use all that data to expand their heuristics. Mm -hmm. Um, Where does that fit into this picture? And the other question is, isn't there an upside, a good side for society for, you know, machine intelligence as well? Oh yeah. I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think there's there. Well, let's go back to the cloud. Um, the, The cloud is important. Um, this whole notion of aggregated intelligent computing is, is very dramatic. The um, I do have an anecdote I want to sh- I want to share with you, and it's, it goes this way: Please. my mother my mother was a nurse, and my my mother she spent her whole lifetime in direct service. She went into an operating room and gave tools to the doctor, and they cut open people. And my sister is a nurse, and she spent the first twenty five years of her life doing direct service in emergency rooms, uh, keeping helping keeping patients alive. In the last five years, she's been on the phone. And her job is to arrange a medevac a triage all over the world. My Important daughter stuff. is a nurse. My daughter's a nurse. She's two years out of nursing school. Her first year, she did direct service. Her second year, she's on the phone. And her job is to counsel uh, patients with regard to pharmaceutical issues. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's look at that curve. So the curve is no time on the phone a fifth of my life on the phone, half of my life, if not all of my life on the phone. And we all know that once we get into telephony and speech recognition versus telephony, now that opens translation into machine intelligence that goes into the cloud. Okay. So my daughter's job will be absorbed by artificial intelligence. 
but wouldn't she in some way be part of the 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 data gathering and and you know life knowledge that goes into that although you said your daughter's just two years out of school so maybe not no, no, she won't be because if we look at most, most, a lot of metrics, uh, metrics now are gathered by machine. And I've been doing a lot of work in uh, actually uh, uh, wearable devices and Internet of Things and collecting that data. Mm -hmm. So we're all those devices are emitting all the time and being collected, aggregated, and analyzed. So that's, and it's beyond the scope of human capability to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So what, so what will the people in the future do? Well, and that's that's the encouraging question, because I'm going to go back to this notion of we you know earn, working for money is a fairly recent phenomenon in human history, mm -hmm. and at one time we all had to work for sustenance. Okay, now we can get the machines to do the sustenance part, hopefully, hopefully, and now it becomes really what do we do with our time on the planet? What do we do with our time as a human being? And the the good news is there's a good case to be made that we're actually could democratized leisure. I mean, if we look at Jefferson, Jefferson's perfect life was, you know, a man farmed in the morning, read in the afternoon and played the violin at night, right? That, that, was, that was the utopian Renaissance man. And now if we can open that time up and we, people realize that, oh, this is possible, we take care of what I'm calling the monetization problem. And that's, 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 that's a can of worms. I don't, I don't think we should go into it now. But what, after we address the monetization problem, Okay, and when we get to full employment, there's going to be an excess of labor. Uh, what's his name? Clay Sharkey talked about it, I think, when he calls it cognitive excess. There's a lot of brain power around that could be used if we let it be used, human brain power. But let's go the other way back and, and say, all right, you know, it, it, that seems a little um, utopian, the idea mm -hmm. that, you know, that might happen. I mean, most, most people today in today's society are going to be – you know, I'm not concerned about what I do. I mean, we're, we're all concerned about what we do with our leisure time. We, we all want to play another video game or, you know, mm -hmm. watch a, another episode of Game of Thrones or whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, the, the concern is less about what do we do with all these idle people because they are fully employed and they have a full income and more. What do we do to make sure these people can, you know, afford to get health care and afford to, you know, buy food, pay their rent, you know, mm -hmm. support their, their families. Mm -hmm. And that's really kind of the, the issue at, at the crux here, isn't it? It's before we get to how they spend their time. It's, it's how do we make sure, how do they make sure, what does society do to, you know, absorb these changes? And, and throughout history, that's been a combination of great pain and education, hasn't it? Yes, it has. And, and let's, look at some, let's look at a recent encouraging fact that really sort of brightened my day is there's, two, there's maybe a few reasons to go to college. Okay. One reason is you go to college to get the skills and experience you need to get a good job. And he, there's another argument that you go to college to get an education. And thus, through getting an education, your ability to think changes, your ability to ponder changes, what becomes important to you might change. You realize there's a whole world out there. And um, when, I, when I was growing up, um, the, the access to a college education, I grew up in New York, was you, any person who graduated high school in a New York City high school could go to college for free. And thus, we created a generation of very... Um, Influential people, A, B, went to City University, um, and I forget the others, but it was real. And then sometime he around- He became the mayor of New York, right? Oh, yes. He became yes. the mayor of New York. Yeah. I think uh, Felix Roy attend too. Don't hold mm -hmm. me to it. I'd have to go and pull it out. But people, you, you could get smart going to a city university and lead the productive um, life that, to which you made a contribution. And then somehow along the line, that, that went away, and a college education became a commodity that you had to purchase in order to be educated. And, um, and again, I'm assuming the choir, because I went to a private uh, college and a private university, so I, I'm not dissing that. And I had student loans, and I was fortunate enough to pay them off. Um, but now college has become unaffordable to many, but New York, the state of New York has now reverted, and state universities and senior universities are, not, are now going to be tuition-free. And what this means is that now the more people that have the opportunity to go to college and become educated, if indeed we can address the, the monetization problem, and I'm not saying the monetization problem is small, it's very, very big, and it's beyond, I think, the scope of this conversation. Mm -hmm. But yeah. let's pretend that we can address the monetization problem. Then what do people do when they no longer have to 
earn money for sustenance. And that becomes a fairly strange notion. Yeah, right? yeah, that's, that's probably beyond the scope of, of most of the ZDNet audience. Right, but well, Picasso didn't have that problem. By the way, I don't think Steve Jobs had that problem or Bill Gates. In what way? I they think worked that, very hard, didn't they? Right, but maybe, well, and so did Picasso, and so did Beethoven, and so did all the, there's mm-hmm. a, as we know, the, the, you know, what was the old joke? You know, I have, a, I have a cartoon out there, a cartoon that says, you know, Dad, what am I going to do when there's no more code left to write? Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> Right. There is, there is internal motivators. There are, there, there, um, let's, I don't think we have to be so um, commercial as to say the only reason people do what they do is for money. Other, other than that is people wouldn't build guitars or, you know, there's, I know a guy out there who builds, um, he builds model jets. Right, mm-hmm. that he has the money to build model jets right, is right. good, but he builds model jets. That's yeah. what he does. He likes it. Um, money is a way. And when remember when Mark and that becomes Zerko, kind of a first world world problem, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. What do you mean by that first world problem? It, well, you know, the the folks who are are still working on you know making sure they can put food on the table are oh, yeah. worried about whether or not they can get you know the parts for a model jet and whether it comes overnight or comes in two days. Right. Again, and, and, but that's fair because, you know, when you go back to Maslow, those fundamental needs, having to mm-hmm. eat, having yep. to drink, those become imperative. So it's very easy to become engaged in that um, work. I have to work to make money to eat. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a right, compelling right, right. argument. That's yep. a compelling argument. But now let's say, and let's say again, the assumption here is we've solved the monetization problem and we solved the monetization problem. Then people wake up one day, a lot of them who've only had Gener- generation to generation, that commercial imperative, right. saying I've got to work to eat. Now what do we do? And the good news here is the more people we can get into a meaningful, meaningful post-secondary educational experience, and by, I mean meaningful, the more the world might open up and say, oh, there are things to do. You know, maybe I should devote my life to, um, you know, philosophy, you mm-hmm. know, and solving some bigger problems. Again, it's a bit fantastic, but when, what do we do when everything's automated? Well, we got to do something because huh. machines are doing the rest. There you go. <laughs> well, let's end it there. Um, uh, let me ask you, how do people find you? Uh, where are you online and how do they read the stuff you're writing? And, yes. Uh, you're also going to scale. So tell us about that too. Well, I went to scale. Scale oh, happened. Okay. I did scale, scale 15. It was very, I, I gave the talk. It was very popular. I'm doing a, uh, we're, I'm doing a, uh, producing a video on April 27th. If you're in LA, we still have some tickets for the Speed in the Studio audience. That's on this topic. We're going to talk about this and then disseminate it over oh, YouTube. Okay. That's, that's coming up April 27th. I'm on, um, I write for uh, uh, devops.com. I write for programmable web, developer.com. You can do a search on me. I'm WrestleBob on Twitter. Um, please feel free to uh, Twitter me about, please write me. I'm WrestleBob, R-E-S-E-L-B-O-B at Gmail. Uh, I'm very, very interested in this topic. I spend a lot of time researching it. My mind is open. I'm going to say I don't have all the answers, but I do realize there is an issue out there. The numbers are saying, yes, this is real. Um, you know, the fast number is 10 years ago, it took 26 people to make a million bucks. Now it takes 2.6 million people to make a million bucks. Um, productivity is going through the roof. So anybody that has ideas, I'm interested in hearing about them. And I'm interested in disseminating to the best of my ability. Okay, just before we go, I'm a little confused. It takes 2.6 million people to make a million dollars. So each person makes 50 cents. No, no, it's to create output. In other, in other words, um, and I did that very quickly. It, the number is it took 26, 26 people to create a million dollars of output pr- productivity wise back 10, 15 years ago. And On I the aggregate get, across the entire country? Yeah, something like okay. that. Yeah. And now um, it takes 2.6 people to create a million dollars of wealth, productive wealth in industry. Okay. And I think the number I heard on, uh, on Ted is, you know, IBM has, you know, a hundred thousand employees. Okay. Um, Red Hat has 40,000 employees and I'll have to confirm this to you, but Snapchat has 55. Yeah. (laughs) So all of these stats, by the way, folks, um, will either be below the video or in the accompanying article, we'll have links to all the the resources that uh that we're citing here so that you can read the the full follow-up on that and with that uh i want to thank bob wrestleman for his time and i'm david gewertz for zdnet government thank you for joining us in the policy and politics coffee house and to everybody a good cup of caffeine there you go good thanks bob